You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Greetings. Welcome to episode 33 of the Common Descent Podcast. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us. Today, we have an episode on ontogeny throughout... What? Yes. Ontogeny and ontogeny throughout the fossil record. What is that big word? Well, I'm glad you asked, David. Ontogeny is the subject of a organism's change throughout its life history. From young to old. Yes. So at how it develops, how it changes, how... And it's, it's a interesting topic because there's a lot of researchers that use it but it itself is just a process that can be observed in many different ways so it is it is the process of an organism changing throughout its life including from the very beginning to the very end so yeah we're going to talk about examples of it you know to give you an idea of what the actual science is to give you examples of how it's used and what it teaches us but then we have some very interesting examples of how it is observed in the fossil record and some really neat stories and particular, we can actually call them kind of controversies. Yes, real controversies. About this. It's, these, are, these are actually pretty heated, so we'll get into that. <laughs> First and foremost, we would like to thank one of our listeners and patrons, Nick, who Ooh. suggested this originally on Twitter. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, thank you very much, because I, I, even though I love this subject, it would have probably taken me a while before I popped in to actually think to do it, <laughs> and it, I'm very excited to, to get through it. Same here. As we are, before we get the ball rolling, as the saying goes, and I, I think they use that in sports stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get that ball rolling. You get that ball rolling, I don't know, bowling uses that. We have a couple of announcements, very quick. First and foremost, very recently, we did a special event that some of you joined us for on YouTube. We had a live sloth chat with some sloth experts. Yes, and it was so much fun. Oh, it was wonderful. It was it was fun. It was interesting. And the people who, who showed up to participate in the chat were were really great. They added a lot and asked some good questions and they made it. They sure did. It was really enjoyable. So that is now saved as a video on our YouTube channel. There'll be links as always. So feel free to follow that and you'll be able to find it and a, a previous one we did as a partial announcement slash Q&A slash field test slash field test 2.0. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you'll hear all about it in there. So our, our first couple of attempts at live streaming were fun and keep an eye out. We might do more of them in the future. Because it was not, it was a lot of fun. They it were sure really was. great. So that is in the past and hopefully on the horizon and recently even more recently than that we would like to announce a new patron Woo. that has joined us martin mihawk thanks and welcome to the common descent family yes welcome martin to our patronage uh, welcome list. to the fold <laughs> <laughs> and to everybody out there who may be considering joining us as a patron Please do. You get all sorts of fun bonuses, including potentially having your name called out, hopefully pronounced correctly, on <laughs> the podcast itself. Indeed. And as we have said before, but it, it stands true, the podcast is now fully funded by your contributions on Patreon. We, we are able to keep it up and running now through those, uh, those proceeds. So it makes a major difference in us being able to do this podcast and in us being able to explore new things like live streaming and doing yeah. video stuff and perhaps maybe some other upcoming things who knows we will see yeah, a lot a lot of a lot of things are in the workshop and in, in getting in <laughs> blueprint mode so we're, we'll see how everything lines up but enough of the announcements enough of the updates time for different updates because we have news, news. to cover we do. So every episode we try to cover as fairly recent. We try to keep it within last episode's time frame to give updates on what's going on in 
specifically paleontology, but sometimes some side branches of science so that we ourselves and you, the listeners, can keep up with what's happening in the scientific community. And to start us off with that update, we have our correspondent, David. That's right, Will. I'm coming to you live from, you know, where I am in front of my computer. (laughs) My first bit of news is from the fossil record, classic, but we're talking a little bit about invertebrates. But it's all right, the best invertebrates. (laughs) <laughs> insects in the fossil record, but more specifically, coloration in insects in the fossil record. Oh, that's fancy. This is a study that was put out by Qingqing Zhang et al. in Science Advances, looking at fossil lepidopterans. Hang on. From leprechauns. The ju- <laughs> fossil leprechauns. <laughs> from the Jurassic of the UK, Germany, China, and Kazakhstan. These include uh, fossil remains of lepidopterans are moths and butterflies. Indeed. Fossil remains of wing scales, as well as impressions of wings. So impressions oh. in this, like a footprint, sort of yeah. an impression in the, in the sediment, going back as old as 180 million years in the past, in the Jurassic period. What they did was they took super close-up microscope examinations, scanning electron microscope, and so on, of these scales and the impressions. It turned out that not only did they were they able to look at the structure, the microscopic structure of the wing scales when they had the scales themselves preserved, but they were also able to examine it just from the impressions of the scales. The, the, the impression in the sediment was detailed enough that they were able to study the structure of the wing from that false, po- that, 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 the negative space. Wow, you would not expect that much detail just from an impression. That's impressive. Yes, it is. It is impressive. <laughs> <laughs> they found a few things looking at these scales. Predominantly, they found that these hyper-ancient scales from very old extinct butterfly slash moths were extremely similar to certain living moths And one of the characteristics of those living moths is that the structure of their scales impacts the color of their wings. So we've talked about fossil coloration, right? Color in the fossil record before. And a lot of the time we're talking about pigments. Pigments are molecules in our skin and hair, fur, that give us certain colors, right? They they interact with light. Actually hold the right chemicals to bounce off light and, and, you know, absorb the right spectrums to give color. Yeah, basically like paint, you know, an actual pigment in there. But there are some animals that get their coloration not because of pigments, but because the very molecular structure of their integument, their feathers, their hair, refracts or reflects or scatters light in a very specific way that it gives off a certain color. So instead of absorbing light, it's bending it. Yes. Cool. Some birds do this with their feathers, and some insects do this as well. In this case, the microscopic structure of these ancient moth scales matches what we see in living moths that produce a, as the authors describe, metallic bronze or golden coloration. Oh, wow. So by just by looking at the structure, the, 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 the physical structure of the wings, you can get a sense of what kind of colors they had. This is actually the oldest evidence of structural coloration in fossils of this particular group of insects. And what they suggest, the authors argue, is that this was something that evolved way back when. So that structural color would have been an important factor in the early evolution of lepidopteran wings, of butterfly and moth wings, very early on in their development. Very interesting. A couple of things they add on to this study. I guess they're not really added on, but I'm not focusing on them at this in this <laughs> reporting. If you want to read it, we'll put the link in the blog post. Uh, they also make the point that this shows that you can get scale information and structural information from impressions in addition to the actual fossils. And they also took a look at the scale structure in some Cretaceous insects called Taracopterans, 
which were not moths or butterflies, but close to moths and butterflies. And by comparing the structure in those cousins, they were able to get a sense of sort of the evolutionary history of scales and, and the wing structure in these insects going back uh, quite a ways. That's really, really neat. It's first cool that they were able to find that kind of information from impressions, not even the right, the physical. That's <laughs> a trace fossil that's yielding huge results. Not to say that they they don't often, but that's that's not an expected one. Yeah. And then the fact that now this, as always, whenever these cool things are found, now people would go, oh, I, I might have an impression that it might need to be looked at that way, too. <laughs> exactly. This is one of the... All right. Everybody, go look at your collections again, and let's Quickly. see if we have this information. Get those drawers open. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So hopefully there will be more moth slash butterfly uh, ancient colors to come. And what a cool color for them to be. Yes, th those moths, some of those living moths, so that the ones they compared them to, mm -hmm. are part of the group Micropterygidae, which are sometimes called, that is to say, I saw this once on the Wikipedia page, Good metallic enough. moths. Damn. That's that's the mecha moths. Mecha moths. <laughs> I was going to say the metallic moths are the good counterparts of oh, yes, chromatic, the chromatic moths. moths. Yeah. Absolutely. You don't want to mess with no. the chromatic moths. No, that's they're just trouble. <laughs> oh, watch out. <laughs> So my first news article, we're going from small fossil creatures to very, very, very large. Naturally. This is about a jawbone that was discovered of an ichthyosaur of truly gigantic proportions uh, from the, the coastal area of England. So this, this is research done by Dean Lomax et al. in Plus One. And I'm reading this main article in National Geographic by John... Pickerel. This is... So first off, some background. Ichthyosaurs, in case anyone doesn't recognize that right off the bat. These are some of the really notable and famous marine reptiles, often used as the comparison for co uh, convergent evolution of marine animals. They look very superficially similar to dolphins in a lot of ways. Yep. Uh, and even just sharks. The reason they get compared to dolphins and not sharks is just they have a very you know tubular shape, I think. I guess dolphins might just be more popular, but yeah, it's it, yeah. They're, they're reptile charismatic. sharks is is also <laughs> a fair assessment, but they have that long snout that you often see them with, and very very successful during the Mesozoic, basically almost from the beginning to the end. They show up in the Triassic during the the late Triassic and last until the late Cretaceous. They were they varied in size. You have small ones to large ones. A lot of them, you know. Around 10 foot was not a, a unusual size for many of them, but there were some that made it large. Uh, one of the big ones that plays a role in this study is Shonisaurus sicanensis, which could grow up to 69 feet long. Yeah. These reptiles have been known for quite a while, but recently, in 2016, on the southeast coastal area of England a bit of bone was found that ended up belonging to one of these animals. Paul de la Salle found, while just fossil hunting, he was a, a self-taught fossil hunter, probably still is, found this chunk of bone, and eventually after looking, found a few more, and contacted Dean Lomax and Judy Masser to help ID it. And after finding those pieces and putting it back together, they were able to ID it as a section of ichthyosaur jaw. Roughly 205 million years old. So looking at the end of Triassic, one of the earlier members, when they took it and compared it to Shonisaurus, they found that it was, compared to the same bone, about 25% larger. Whoa. So as you do, they scaled up the body <laughs> and found that if we keep the same proportions of Shonisaurus, we'd be looking at an 85-foot-long ichthyosaur. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And it's important to note that, yes, there are a couple of whales that get to that size, mm -hmm. but that's about it. The, the ever-famous blue whale, which is touted, as the article 
uh, uh, use the word, as the largest animal that ever lived, yep. is often ranged at max size about 98 feet long. And that that's, so just about 100 feet is, for, and then weighing a ridiculous amount. So Wait, this Weighing is, about as much as a blue whale. Yes, I mean, roughly. That animal often gets the record for being the largest animal ever. What this shows us is that there were competitors for sizes of that uh, of that animal, of that category, of that cattle caliber, which is interesting. That's something that now we know to look for that. And they made the point that there's a lot of partial fossils that have been found in that area or near that area. It's a, a near a village called uh, Aust that they now call these fossils Aust fossils that they want to re-examine that may also be from large ichthyosaurs that had previously been identified as limbs or ribs that never really quite sat right with a few people. So there may be giants to rival those of today, the one of today, really, still swimming out there in the fossil past. Part of me is very excited by the thought of finding super ancient super giants, but there's also part of me that would feel really bad for the poor blue whale. Yeah. (laughs) Like, it's always the go-to, like, people are, oh, why were animals in the past so big? And, and we get to go, well, keep in mind, the biggest one is still alive today. That'd be, it'd be a shame if we couldn't say that anymore. I would be a little bit disappointed. <laughs> yeah, for the blue whale to lose its largest animal status. Wouldn't surprise me, but oh well. Absolutely. Oh, whale. How, oh, whale. How, how the mighty fall. <laughs> We're we're if if this means anything, we're rooting for you, Blue Whale. Yes, we're on your <laughs> side, Team Blue Whale. <laughs> That's not true at all, Team Mosasaur. So, Team Mosasaur. My second bit of news is about hominins, specifically bum, bum, bum. the weird faces of Neanderthals. That's rude. Uh, though they had weird faces, this is just a fact. <laughs> this, this is science. This is, no, this is scientific fact. I can prove it. That's science. <laughs> I can prove it with a with a, a study by Stephen Rowe et al. in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B. This is also written about and will be linked to in our blog post on live science uh, in an article by Mindy Weisberger. This is another one of those studies where people did some hypothesis testing. How about that? Oh, these are fun. The story begins with people noticing that Neanderthals have weird faces. Particularly, their faces have this protruding shape. Sort of the middle part of their face sticks forward more than you see in humans and more than you see in other hominins. This has been the subject of much discussion. Why do they have weird faces? Why? Why? Two hypotheses were tested in this study. The first, that as some people have suggested, it may have been related to a greater bite force. Some people have noticed certain patterns of tooth wear, the, the damage that accumulates on the teeth that make them think maybe they were biting harder and, 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 and accumulating, you know, undergoing more strain than, Being say, humans. Stuff or... Yep. The other hypothesis is that they had a different, there were differences to their airway, that they were either conditioning the air differently as it comes, as they breathe it in, or that they were, you know, they, there was a difference in the in how much their air was moving in and out of their nasal passages. So either differences to bite force or differences to airways. The airways is one I've heard very regularly. Yep. So they tested these. They took x-ray CT scans of Neanderthal skulls and digitally modeled them. They used a type of analysis called finite element analysis, which any Ooh. our statisticians out there might be familiar with. This is the same kind of thing you use to test the bite force of things like T-Rex. This is the first study to, uh, to, to analyze the bite force of Neanderthals. They compared them with modern humans and an earlier hominin named Homo heidelbergensis, which may or may not be the direct ancestor of Neanderthals and humans, but at least it's a slightly earlier relative. And what they found is that the strain on the teeth when they reconstruct the bite musculature is about the same in all three species. So the Neanderthals do not look like they were biting harder or experiencing more strain. Yeah, they fall right within the average. The next thing they did was they recreated the soft tissue of the nasal passages and modeled the movement of air through the the passages that they, they were able to remodel 
That's uh, cool. studying fluid dynamics. Yeah, it's cool stuff. That's cool. <laughs> They examined how the nasal passages could heat up and humidify the air, right? So these were species that lived in cold, dry places. So when you breathe in, you want to be able to heat up and humidify that air as it comes in. They found that Neanderthals were better at doing that than the earlier species, but not as good as humans, modern humans, that we are both adapted to breathing in colder, drier climates, and that humans are actually better at humidifying at at conditioning the air humidifying as it comes in yes (laughs) then they tested finally how much air was able to move through and what they found was that neanderthals were almost twice as effective as humans at pulling in air into their nasal passages They weren't better at conditioning it, but they were able to breathe in a lot more volume of air, a lot more quantity with each breath. This is pretty interesting because one of the big things that you would have to breathe in lots more air for is if you have higher energy requirements, right? Other animals, this isn't a direct comparison, but just for example, other animals that have highly enhanced breathing systems include things like horses and cheetahs. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, you're using a lot of energy, you're breathing in a lot of air. So this might reflect uh, something in the difference in the Neanderthals' sort of energy expenditure, their energy requirements uh, over the course of their general lives. Very cool. And thus, the mystery of Neanderthals' weird schnozzes is maybe solved. I won't say solved, but interesting new developments. (laughs) Yes, new ground is broken in this subject. That's that's very that's an unexpected turnaround. I've heard multiple documentaries and other things dealing with Neanderthals making the assertion that the larger nose helped them warm the air because they they some of the reasons I heard is because they didn't migrate or they didn't migrate as much as our ancestors did, so they stuck through the dead of winter and they had to be able to survive the brutal cold. So finding out that we are both good at it and we actually had the better system is interesting. Yeah. The more intake is very interesting because that has a lot of effect on how much your activity is. Yeah. They were able to take bigger breaths. Yeah. I'd, I'd be interested to see what other conclusions people who know more about hominid anatomy are going to be able to draw from that. Yes. And what more we can learn about our... Uh, strange cousins meet yeah strange only because we're these the ones that are still around yeah because we won that yeah we won and yeah so we we can call whatever the, yeah by the <laughs> extant species we can call them whatever we want what are they gonna do about it <laughs> <laughs> i am taking things back to the water Ooh. but going more recent this is a, a very interesting thing about a modern group and an interesting aspect of their survival that posits an answer for one of the big questions. It is about sea turtles and how they find their way home. Ah. Yeah. So this is a study that found evidence showing that loggerhead sea turtles are able to use Earth's magnetic field to navigate back to their nesting sites, which is not an unusual concept, but the way they found it is real cool. So this research was done by Brothers and Lohman, in current biology and uh, found this article in New York Times and written by Karen Weintraub. It's, as I said, this is not an unusual concept and the concept that they find their way homes is not unusual either. That's been known for a long time that turtles can go back to the site they were born at or near to it and that they always return to those areas for nesting. Uh, Typically, the article says about between 40 and 50 miles from where they were born. So that's a pretty narrow range considering you're dealing with all of the ocean. So they're really good at it. They already knew some things, like that they were able to sense electric fields, the intensity and the angle, which is the amount that how closely the magnetic field is lying toward the surface of of Earth. So basically where you are on the planet uh, toward or away from the poles will affect a lot of that because of the way the magnetic field bends back around and all that good stuff. So they, we knew they could sense it, but recent research, genetic research, 
found something interesting that points to this being a main tool in them finding their ways home. They did a survey a genetic of genetic information on over 800 nesting loggerheads. Wow. Yeah, and just to let you know, loggerheads are uh, not the largest species of sea turtle, but they have the largest head, as their name implies, and they are big crab eaters. So they, they've got this big, powerful head and are one of the one of the sea turtles that you'll see very often portrayed in stuff because they're very popular. They found, while looking at these loggerheads, that there were more similarities between populations on islands with similar magnetic signatures than on islands that were geographically closer to each other. Huh. So the genetics matched up better based on the magnetic signature of the beaches that they nested on. Exactly. So basically, wow. the islands being close together were not finding populations closely related, but islands similar in their how they were uh, uh, being affected by the Earth's magnetic field were being found with populations closely related. And they are thinking the reason for this is that while a turtle is finding its way home, if they are using magnets these islands will look almost identical. So they're getting confused every now and then and going to a similar but different island and you're getting crossover between these two populations that are making the gene pools more similar. The reason for this is something known as geomagnetic imprinting, which is what they are positing the turtles use, is basically when these turtles are born on a beach Within that, either within their development or within their first moments of being born, they, not not in the way we memorize stuff, but they memorize the magnetic signature of that beach. It is imprinted upon them, permanently laser etched into their brain. And so when they go off, whenever mating season comes back for them to nest, they look up that signature and they follow the signs toward it. But if there's a signature that's almost identical, they may go the wrong way for who knows what reason right and then deliver their family ge genealogy to a, a new place and they found this was even more consistent than things environmentally like temperature of the different beaches did not have as much effect on where the turtles were ending up than the magnetic signature did wow yeah so this is this is really exciting and these things are all known already in in nature Fish and birds are already known to actively use magnetic signatures, uh, magnetic fields to navigate. Uh, there are some sharks that we have seen evidence use the same thing. And geomagnetic imprinting is not a, a completely new concept, but it has long been thought for turtles. This is some of the first, some solid evidence for it. That's really cool. There was a it was a study that came out a couple of years ago that was aiming to answer the same question, right? Do sea turtles really use the magnetic fields to find their way home? And what that study did was look at how the magnetic fields have shifted. So they studied it was like 20 or 30 years of magnetic field history along a coastline. Oh, interesting. Because what yeah, the magnetic field sort of weakens and strengthens over time. And what they found was they compared it to sea turtle nesting history. And they found that the sea turtles n tended to follow the densest <laughs> areas of the magnetic field. That when the magnetic field got stronger, there was more nesting in that area. And when the magnetic field would get weaker, there was less nesting in that area. That's very cool. So we've got evidence coming in, it seems, from... Sort of the observe, you know, the physical out there in the world, comparing the geology to the to the nesting habits, and then from genetics, I wouldn't even have thought to look at the genetics. That right? is such a cool finding. Now the researchers, uh, they they say that there's a number of ways we could use this to help out. We could ID nesting sites and and ideal or potential sites that the turtles would go to. They also made the idea, which is very interesting. I don't know. How, how exactly it would be implemented or whether, you know, there, there's there's potential cons that pop up, but for in my mind, I mean. But they said that there is the potential to actually redirect turtles to more ideal be beaches where they can be better protected. 
by Ooh. either by manipulating the magnetic fields potentially while they're developing and basically give them a different island signature that will be within a place where they are going to be protected. Well, that would be interesting. That's very interesting. There's a lot of a lot of questions and uh, interesting or, or intriguing things that we have to look into with that concept. Wow. Cool news today. Yeah. Magnetic turtles. <laughs> Magnetic <laughs> turtles. Ichthyosaurs of unusual size. <laughs> we have metallic moths. Metallic moths and all sorts big of big noses. Stuff. Big noses. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, we have wrapped up our news. So here in just a moment, we will be able to move on to the to the main event, the main course, and discuss ontogeny and its evidences in the fossil record. So look forward to that. As I said, today we are covering ontogeny. Gave you a brief definition early on. Ontogeny is the development of an organism from technically fertilization to maturity or even throughout the entire extent of its life. So from the first time it can be called a budding life form to all the way through adolescence, you know, maturing, adulthood, and depending on where you're where how far you're wanting to look even into their decline into death we a few of the terms that you'll hear a lot of today embryo is going to be a big one for a lot of it embryos are fertilized eggs that are developing in inside either the the egg or the womb or the the egg inside the womb depending on the animal you're looking at yes uh, pre pre birth <laughs> pre birth so this is where the body is being built and cells are dividing. People look at, you know, researchers who study this can look at the very beginning all the way through to just before birth. We'll go into that. Embryology is when you're studying yes. the development, the ontogeny just of the embryo. And we will, we will talk about how, how that, what we learn from that and, and how that affects. Juvenile is another big term here, which just means a, a young animal typically before sexual maturity is really kind of the cutoff uh, for most, as as many definitions, sort of like what we talked about with uh, megafauna, there yep. are different there are different <laughs> degrees, and we'll talk about. There's a big aspect of one of those, and that's the term adult. Typically, that means a sexually mature individual of an animal. Now, that definition does not hold true all the time. For instance, with us, we are sexually mature before we are legally considered adults. Yes, you know so. We'll get into that because that that causes some very interesting complications in defining these terms when you're looking at certain animals and especially dead ones. Yeah, juvenile comes up a lot. And whenever yes. I use it, I'm always a little worried because it's such a common term for me to hear. Yeah. But I always, I always have that thought where I'm like, I don't know how we don't really use juvenile in that context in normal speech. So, yes, juvenile to adults. For convenience, we'll switch over to youngling from now on. <laughs> as, as much as I love Star Wars, there was I I very quickly hit a moment where it's like, just call them kids. <laughs> Children. <laughs> Sometimes in animals, you'll also hear people divvy up uh, the, those early stages. You'll hear hatchling yes. or you'll hear yearling. Sometimes you'll hear a yearling, things like that. It depends on what. And basically those just mean extremely young just yeah fresh barely, out the egg or fresh barely out the born womb. yes uh you will get also and we'll talk about this in just a moment uh things like larva which is another specific stage for particular life cycles before you move into your adult body form because you actually have to change bodies you actually have to change what your design is larva pupa adult some creatures also get very specific terms like the instars of insects as they develop yes for very particular life stages so it varies depending on what creature you're talking about and that that really is the key point is every single organism's ontogeny is pretty much unique to it you can find things that are very common among a lot of them but every single one could have specific quirks 
that only that species or only this group shows or this one shows it in a weird way. And that's part of what people look for in ontogeny. Now, uh, some of the we're going to look through the studies that focus on ontogeny, because as I mentioned, autonomy is a a system of or a process that life goes through while studies like embryology, developmental biology and evolutionary developmental biology <laughs> are some of the big ones that use this. You will hear sometimes things like developmental biology used as a synonym for, for ontogeny, which is not uncommon, but kind of it kind of mixes them up. One's a study of the other. Right, so right, right. We'll go through those in a little more detail to show you what we really learn from each one. The main thing I wanted to focus on as we were defining it is to give you kind of the generic trends to really give you some of the things that you can see in ontology. Because it's not just things going from small to big. There are actually some crazy changes that happen while you grow that you don't think of until they're pointed out. And the most common one deals with this. Here's really big fun word. And this is actually what my research dealt with and is ontogenetic allometry. Whoa. Ooh, big. This is my, that's my $4 word. <laughs> This is, this is the I'd most give you a five for it. Five. Oh, my good sir. You seem like a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> I like your face. <laughs> this is what you most commonly will hear of when, when after birth ontogeny is discussing is typically this is the change in body proportions. Yes. Allometry. Allo meaning different. Metry meaning shape. Yep. So basically, as you're growing, you're, even when you look very similar to your adult form, there's almost always changes. The most common ones, if you just think about it, in us, babies have big heads, big eyes, short limbs, and there's, also, there's, lots of, there's other little things. Like if you look at the skeleton, they look really different from an adult's. Yeah. But just on the outside, if you saw a baby that was six foot tall, it would look like a monster because its head would be the size <laughs> of a of a stroller itself, and its arms would be these little chubby sausages. Yeah, because and those short little pudgy legs couldn't carry it around. No, it would be it would be so disturbing because we don't stay that shape, even though we look we look like a person all the way through. We've got two eyes, a nose, ears, arms, yeah. and legs, fuzzy head. So we look like a person the whole way through, but we are shaped differently, you know, and when you go through puberty, that's why a lot of people say they shoot up because your limbs suddenly lengthen out to take adult proportions and you, you suddenly change. And a lot of animals go through this. This is very, very common. Almost all animals experience some amount of this. Yeah, most animals aren't born as tiny, identical versions of their adult form. And even ones that you think of that way, like sharks that are born as functioning sharks, mm -hmm. still have little things. Their fins are not the right size to their body yet, you know, and you can find little things. Sometimes it has to take very specific measuring, but this is what you will most often see in the life growth of an animal. But after, after they've been born, it usually deals with some form of allometry. You also get, as you said, the skeletal, you know, babies have unfused skeletons. Mammals, yes. especially, you get the, Well, a lot of animals, but in mammals with the leg bones and the arm bones and your skull bones aren't fully connected yet. As we grow, we also replace our teeth. I was about to say, it's one of the easiest ways to, one of the easiest things we can relate to is we all had baby teeth and we all had grown up teeth. And some of us got extra grown up teeth even later on. <laughs> yes <laughs> wisdom teeth coming in is another form of allometric change that will tell apart a 15 year old who's gotten rid of baby teeth from a 30 year old who now has these extra teeth that are you know so there's a lot of these and it, it's internal throughout the whole body changes are going on our glands are activating at different points our different parts of our genetics and our body parts mature at different rates you know, the brain is not done growing until we're well past what we consider an adult human. You know, our brain is still kind of finalizing. It's, That's it's part of the very... argument about legalizing things to certain yes. ages is that our brain goes through stages of development. And so it's it's very interesting stuff. One of the most dramatic versions of this that's 
kind of in its own category is metamorphosis, which is a change in body after they're born, but not just through growth, they actually have to go through a metamorphosis. They have to change in a in a very active process. So this is where terms like larva get used. And this is the stage. It's like we were saying hatchling. Larva is the first stage after they're born that is not yet to the adult shape. Frog tadpoles, fly maggots. Gregor beetle. Samsa, Charmander. <laughs> yes, yes. So all of these are larval. And so you can get, mostly we think of it with insects and invertebrates, but you do get them with amphibians as well. Yep. Corals. Corals, absolutely. Jellies and all of those. The the key is that you start in a different body shape and then you change into the adult form. Now, tadpoles just kind of grow into it. They still go through a metamorphosis, but it's they don't have the dramatic stage of insects of the pupa and the cocoon, the, the encapsulating themselves and then shedding out their skin into a yeah. new body design. They don't turn into goo. Yes. And then get rematerialized as an adult. They aren't sci-fi <laughs> horror films. <laughs> caterpillars. Caterpillars are sci-fi horror films. Yep. And so you very, very dramatic. Uh you you often see even trends within that with like a lot of aquatic animals. They larva is usually free swimming, even if the adult is uh a crawling or a, a sessile, you know, fixed to the ground organism. Like sea anemones start out like little baby jellyfish. But then land upside down and turn into a little little polyp that sits on the, the ground. Crabs and lobsters start by swimming around and then they land on the ground and start walking when their tail gets all short. There, there are uh, insect larvae that are aquatic. Uh, yes. Mayflies and dragonflies, I believe, do this. They have n- naiads are their larval forms that live in the water for a long time until they metamorphose into their adults naiads and nymphs and they are fantastic oh super cool stuff they they are they are my favorite (laughs) larvae hands down they're my favorite adults (laughs) these are all cool concepts in how we develop and how organisms develop but why would studying this tell us something useful right we all know things change what can we learn by studying how they change and there's a number of fields of science that focus on this the first and most obvious right away is embryology that we already mentioned. Mm-hmm. The study of fertilization, cell development, and fetal growth of an embryo before it's born. This sounds like it's something that might just be neat. It's actually huge in the things it can reveal because there are some crazy things that happen during the embryo development that can give you very interesting insights. For instance... When your egg first is fertilized and then starts to divide, you know, a single cell becomes multiple cells and multiple cells, depending on which branch of life you're in, depends on which parts of that now blob of cells become which part of your body. And that's, it's a really complex process, but depending on which part becomes your butt and which part becomes your face, which part becomes your (laughs) intestines, happens in different ways in different sections and in different orders depending on which major group of life you're in and that's part of how a lot of them are categorized and that's a really interesting it's it's really interesting to compare that because a lot of animal embryos start off very very similar yes and the big differences aren't necessarily always that you have a different body part but that the early development happens with slightly different timing or it happens in a slightly different part of the embryo or this part gets copied again and now you have an extra limb or something it's making minor tweaks to that early embryonic development can lead to major differences in your ultimate form your has final sh- form has, has huge effects on your adulthood and and studying the order of things studying the processes that go into creating different body forms and studying it across closely related groups and organisms can potentially give you evidence for how a certain body type a body part or body design evolved because if we see a similar process in a number of groups and we can see the slow rise of this one body part it can give us clues of like well 
there's where the mutation happened at some point. That This area is what gave rise to the antenna, or the fin, or the gills, which can start to give like, you connect dots that might tell you relationships, or at least how do things develop? How do we get these new kinds of limbs and body plans that seem so weird from one another? Because at some point, they were very similar. And indeed, a lot of studies of development and a lot of, of studies of how body forms come about involve poking at embryos. Yep, a lot of like, it. When you hear a lot of those studies of, uh, you know, with lab rats or fruit flies, and they'll say, you know, or the, uh, the famous, uh, our listeners may be familiar, with the studies that have grown teeth in chickens, or more recently that, that made the bird beak develop more into a snout, sort of, quote, reactivating, kind of, those more ancestral genetic patterns, those weren't adult chickens with teeth. They did it in embryo. They put, they manipulated the embryo and they watched how it developed in the embryo. Because if you're messing with embryonic development, odds are you're not gonna that thing's not gonna develop into a proper adult anyway. Yeah, no, it's it's goner, and, but and you shouldn't want it to <laughs> because <laughs> you've made a weird Frankenstein creature and you don't want kill. That. Me. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you did this to me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, a lot of that is done, you know, fruit flies, obviously, are the famous example. Of yes. Growing antenna where their wings should be or legs where their antenna should be by m mucking around with their embryonic. And look at why that happened. And this is where embryology starts to overlap with the, the next major field of study, evolutionary developmental biology or Evo Devo. Yes, we should mention real quick, uh, because we will talk more about fossils. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can even study embryology in the fossil record. Yes, there you are can. Embryo, embryonic, embryo, embryological fossils. You get fossils of creatures in eggs. Uh, there are possible free, uh, sort of just the embryos of invertebrate creatures found way, way back in the Cambrian. We've already talked about examples before of animals found in the womb. Yep. Before they were born. Often fairly well developed, but still embryos and sometimes even with umbilical cords present. Yes, we talked about that with our placoderms. Placoderm, yes, that's right. It was the placoderms yep. with the umbilical cord. Not too long ago, there was a famous, a, a, a sort of, it became famous fossil of a pregnant horse. Oh, uh, the, right. The fetus was preserved inside the horse. At the Gray Fossil site, we had a fetal rhino. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Yeah. Absolutely. So you can and definitely so, get embryo fossils. They're they're rare and sometimes hard to be sure because if the bones get scattered around, but finding it inside the reproductive area is pretty darn good evidence that that was yes. a baby yet to be born. <laughs> or in an egg. Yes. Obviously, you can't muck around with genetics in, a, in an embryo fossil, but you can definitely learn about the very, very early development of a creature. And so there's there's a lot of cool moments like that. We'll, we'll get into some of the discoveries that have been made about that. Oh, boy. Now, what this leads into, as, as David was getting into, is the, the evolutionary development research, Evo Devo, Evo deals Devo. heavily with embryology, but it also can deal with after the animal's been born and developing. Basically, what this study is trying to determine, this is a quote from uh, an article that Joe Wolf wrote, it's, why do organisms look the way they do and how did they get that way? Which I think really well huh. sums up. Yeah, that's cool. What that's basically that means, it. yeah, basically what they're touching on is how do embryos, even the before, how do embryos develop? How did embryo development evolve? Like when did the embryos first start to be a thing? You know, when did we start having babies and not just making copies? When did, you know, the origins of, development how did the origin of, like how did a feature come about and be modified how does the life stages that we already kind of mentioned when did they start to come around and how have they been modified and then how do genetics and the observable traits the genotypes and phenotypes actually interact during development and throughout life the more we learn about genetics, we 
the whole concept of that movies have of if I take a strand of your hair and I put it in a machine that can clone you, it will pump out a version of you, which is not true at all. If I <laughs> took a string of David's hair and cloned him and then somehow were able to fast age him, I assume with like folding time. Yeah, clearly. Hyperbolic time chamber. Yep. Brrrr, to his current age, he'd probably look completely different. You did had... this to me. <laughs> 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 he wouldn't have had the same life history. He wouldn't have had the same effects on him. Our DNA is constantly changing due to the things we're experiencing. So there's lots of things that can affect it. And this is one of the things that's looking at how does DNA affect those traits and how did a lot of these things first come to be and how have they changed over time? It's a big question that can be zoomed down into lots of different subjects. Yeah, like we said before about how minor adjustments to the embryological development can create differences in adult forms. That's a huge part of evolutionary process is, you know, it, it's it's not just, you know, I evolved a pair of wings or something. It's a lot of the time it seems to be that a minor change occurred in the embryological development. And that's what leads to the bigger changes later on. Quick little history lesson on this before we we start to go into one of our, our next, one of my favorite concepts in ontogeny studies. There's a concept known as ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny that was one of the older concepts and ORP sometimes. I've seen it yeah. shortened. Orp. And this is ORP. The ORP concept is that by taking the embryo phases and the different the different growth patterns of different animals embryos they will show you the ancestry of that animal basically that our embryo goes through the phases the physical phases of our previous ancestors and the reason this idea came up is cuz when you look at certain animals embryos like most vertebrates we go through a very fishy phase in our embryo stage where we have like a long straight tail and what looks like very gill-like structures. And the idea was that if you were to look through an, an uh, our embryo from beginning to end, you would see a single cell, multi-celled, a some kind of invertebrate form, a fish form, some sort of amphibianish or reptilish form, and then a, a mammal form. Yeah, Us. a fast forward of our whole evolutionary history was the thought. That does not hold water. There's still some things in there. It's true that you see similar physical traits in a lot of vertebrates. We do have the, not gill arches, they're not actually gills, but they are the structures that will become gills in the fish line. And we share that feature that do not become gills in our line. So we never have gills, but we have that part that in other lines did. Yeah, in us, those same features go towards the structures like the jaw and some of the, the structures in the throat. And it, it, that what that tells you is that, that you have a common starting point. Yes, we have some somewhere, somewhere down the line, there was something that had that form and then it kept splitting off into other groups and they all retained that form in their development. But it does different things as we grow up, depending on what tr evolutionary trajectory we're on. Exactly. And that was what really kind of put the nail in the coffin of ORP. Because this was popular during the 1800s and, and throughout there. But as people started to look more, they realized that changes in different phases can happen all throughout the embryo, the embryological process. And they, they it's, it's com almost completely different from animal to animal when you really look at the process. But you do find some patterns. And so there is there's a, a grain there that that is still observable and, and gives us some good information. But that, that original idea that you'll, you'll hear that sometimes I still see pictures pop up with the, that famous picture of the, the pig, the chicken, the turtle, yep. the fish and the person and all of our embryos lined up showing that we go through extremely similar process, which is not wrong, but gives the wrong impression. I think. Yeah. It's, it's not that it's, ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny in the sense that the ontogeny shows you the the evolutionary history but what i think that is useful in demonstrating is how similar our development is because it's built on the same stuff exactly the same process is happening there just with different tweaks and changes 
those minor evolutionary shifts in development. So this gives us lots of hints to phylogeny. Uh, one of the things that David also mentioned the are the, the genetic things that have been able to be unlocked, quote unquote, in certain animals that show potential ancestral traits like teeth and birds and you know different kind the fact that you can switch certain genes these are known as developmental gene toolkits these these codes of dna that really affect that have a a specific job to form your body plan during development and certain of these the famous hox genes which we've already mentioned before these these key features that this hox gene codes for leg and when surrounded with different dna codes for a specific kind of leg. But when you switch the leg hoxes in different animals, they grow legs. You know, if you take a fly hox gene for leg and put it into a mouse, it grows a mouse leg because it's got mouse DNA around it telling it what to do. Yeah, they did that with coelacanths. Mm -hmm. The fish coelacanth, they took the limb development genes yeah. uh, and found that the, the limb development genes in a coelacanth will code for leg growth in mice. Exactly. And so this once again, if that's across fish and insects and mammals, it's a very ancestral trait that had to show up a long, long time ago. And by studying these things in development, by changing, tweaking, and then watching develop, we wouldn't have been able to get this clue other than by watching these animals grow and how the different things come from. So it gives you a lot of hints toward evolutionary history and... Uh, can tell you a lot about where different traits came from. Two quick ones, and then we're going to move on to what I know a lot of people are, are excited for is cool fossil examples and cool fossil concepts. Yes. The last two are neoteny and behavior through development, which is something that a lot of people don't know qualifies as an ontogeny study. Sure does. But it does. Neoteny is the fun one. That is, <laughs> it's a very quirky one. It's It's... Neoteny is the process or characteristic of maintaining juvenile traits into adulthood. Not man-child, but not not man-child. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good explanation. Moving on. <laughs> is it good? We good? All right. No, cool. basically, this is the idea that since you do change from juvenile to adult, that through evolution, there are some animals that in their adult phase resemble or keep traits that other of their relatives only show in the, the young phase. Basically, they maintain a very young-looking body design throughout their whole life. The go-to is the axolotl, a very, very popular type of salamander that is popular as pets today. I would be surprised if that popularity was not in big part due to a Pokemon known as Mudkip. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think they were popular. I think they're actually Mudkip is based on axolotls because axolotls because they're are popular, popular, which pets. is which is probably true. But yeah. that definitely didn't hurt. <laughs> axolotls are these uh, fully aquatic salamanders. They look like a salamander throughout their whole body for the most part, except they have these frills on either side of the head that are actually their external gills. These these feathery looking. They look like ears. You know, or, or tufts behind where the ears would be. But they are these these little, not prongs, because they're very flexible, but these little little branches get, come out with little gills coming off the bottom. Very feathery external gills, which most larval salamanders have when they're young. Yes. That's a very common thing to see among them, because they are aquatic and they need to breathe under the water. And breathing through your skin is not as efficient as just having gills. The axolotl, at some point in its evolution who just stay in the water all the time, never got rid of the gills. Yes, they keep that juvenile trait mm -hmm. into adulthood. They've evolved to keep that. Almost going backward or regressing can sometimes be a very advantageous trait because babies have to survive just like the adults. And what helped the baby in the right situation can help an adult. So you see a lot of things like that. You'll also hear, so there's the phrase neoteny and there's also the term pedamorphosis. Yes. Which some people, sometimes they're used to mean slightly different things. I've heard, I've heard people refer to neoteny being an in the life of an organism process. So that, mm -hmm. for example, some salamanders 
sometimes grow into full adults, but in certain circumstances will retain juvenile traits, will retain their gills into adulthood or something like that. And into adulthood, what we mean, you know, they sexually mature and everything else, yeah. but they hold on to certain young traits. And it can also happen over evolutionary time that you evolve that your whole species holds on to traits. You as a, as a species look like the baby of another species. Yeah, you look like the babies of your ancestors mm -hmm. because you've held on to certain so that like in the case of something like an axolotl if the whole species is now in the habit of holding on to those juvenile traits into adulthood it used to be just a baby thing now it's an all it's an adult thing so i've heard neoteny and pedamorphosis used that some some use one for the evolutionary trajectory and some for the over the life of one creature other people argue that they mean the same thing but you might hear you might hear both. Yes, those those definitely can get uh, kind of traded back and forth. Two other quick ones that are just fun examples you can see in many of your own homes: domestic dogs. <laughs> yeah. Domestic dogs have very puppy-like traits even into adulthood: big eyes, shorter snouts, larger head. Yeah, they look like puppy wolves. Yeah, they look like puppy wolves, and the, it's funny because the short snout and some have even quoted the floppy ears as being puppy-like traits, are also traits that are very common of just domestication. Yes. Which makes sense because we like babies. Babies are cute. So we want you to look like a baby all the time. Their playfulness is also part of that. The fact that they're very playful throughout their whole life is not something wolves retain. They're very playful as puppies, and they become grown-ups, and they now have to do wolf stuff. Arguably a neotenic mm -hmm. feature. Mm-hmm. Some people have even argued it with people. The fact that we have very large heads and large eyes and proportionally to other primates, shorter limbs, a flat face as well. There's a number of features that point to that we may have retained juvenile traits and that may have been part of what allowed us to have a bigger brain because if you're gonna have this big brain, you got a big old head as a baby, just keep scaling that thing up. <laughs> yeah, we, we have a lot of features in common with the baby versions of other apes yes like we look like baby chimps yep in a lot of ways not that we obviously th th the idea there being that chimps kept the quote normal pattern and they, we they may grew have up evolved. they grew up yeah <laughs> and we have evolved to hold on to some of those juvenile traits there was actually uh there was an essay by i wish i could find this but the book is in a box somewhere there was an essay by stephen jay gould i think in his book uh, ever since Darwin, mm -hmm. where he talked about the when the idea of neoteny in in, in in evolutionary sense was sort of gaining steam in the science scientific community, and there was a science fiction short story that took this idea oh. to an interesting extreme, and the story went you know the idea that you basically delayed development of certain traits. Yes. And the story was about, I can't remember the name of the story. I wish I could. If, I'll, I'll see if I can find it and then post it in the blog post. But the author had written a story where a couple of people, I think, gain, you know, it's reported that they gain the secret of immortality and, and they live for, for many, many, many years. And someone is trying to investigate them because shortly after they discovered the secret to immortality, they disappeared and no one has seen them again. And when the person finally finds them, what they discover is that they grew up into apes. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea that the yes. development was just delayed to an age that we never grow to. <laughs> and if you become immortal, you eventually fully grow up and become some sort of ape creature, which is not at all how the science no, no. <laughs> actually works. <laughs> that immediately makes me think of the original Planet of the Apes when... when the guy finally shaves his beard that he, he grew from having to be in, in ape prison and whatnot. And he sh it's at the very end of the movie. He shaves it when he's going to go off and, and find his own place. And he comes back to the to the, the main guy ape character. And he looks at him and he goes, you somehow look less intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> That's immediately what that made me think of. So if you would just progress further, you could be just like us. <laughs> the case of human neoteny is an interesting uh, another really interesting case of that 
is the lactase gene that pretty much all mammals are born with the ability to produce lactase, which allows them to break down lactose, which means you can drink milk. But pretty much every mammal loses the ability to produce lactase when they grow up because you're not drinking milk anymore when you grow up, so you don't need that anymore. Certain groups of humans have... It's very interesting that it's only certain. Only, I think it's evolved two or three times, at which is, least. Which is really cool. There is a mutation in a very specific place. We could identify the exact point of this mutation that breaks the switch that turns off lactase production. So some of us, like us, the two people mm -hmm. speaking to you, us European folk, Yarp. keep producing lactase, which means we can drink milk as adults. Being lactose tolerant is super weird. And it's a speaking. juvenile trait in mammals. Which is, and once again, you can see where the push for that advantage would have been if you're having to be nomadic and travel around and you have already domesticated cows and you start noticing that, oh, those babies really love that milk. I'm super hungry. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the evolution, the earliest evolution of those mutations shows up in humans not too long after the early domestication of cows. So readily available food and drink source. There's an obvious advantage there. Sure is. It's very cool stuff. My, my favorite example is Barry Boggan, uh, an anthropologist, pegged Betty Boop as an ideal example of neoteny in humans. <laughs> <laughs> it's big head, big eyes, bumbly and clumsy, tiny voice. <laughs> so I loved that. I thought that was fun. Really quick to wrap up this this overview of the studies i wanted to end with the behavioral part mostly because there's one particular study that i i it's one of my favorite scientific studies ever you'll never guess what animal it deals with not in a million years don't even try snakes snakes <laughs> snakes come so, on snakes so gigak and erickson did a alligator study oh <laughs> whoa i was hoping they measured the bite forces of alligators through different sizes and compared it to the requirements, the force requirements that would be needed to eat the different foods that they typically are found eating at the different sizes to see how well it all matches up and to show or to find how ontogeny, like increased bite force, longer snouts and body sizes affect what they're able to eat. Because alligators have a ridiculous development from birth to the, the full size, they go through a 7,000 fold increase, <laughs> which is not quite 7,000 times bigger, but it is very close to that, that <laughs> level. They are huge compared to when they're first born, and that greatly affects their role in the ecosystem. Yeah, they grow up through every stage of the food web. They start at the bottom, end at the very top. So ontogeny can also give you lots of clues onto how is this animal actually functioning within its environment yeah what you can eat what role you play in your ecosystem this also mm -hmm. comes up as we will see in fossils indeed it does so next we are going to cover fossils and we're going to go over really one of the main things that's interesting is some of the difficulties in studying ontogeny the fossil record and some cool fossils and their examples of ontogeny So, fossils and ontogeny in the fossil record. Woo. First and foremost, there's definitely lots of cool evidence for development in fossil organisms. We have lots of cool... We already talked about uh, embryos. Mm -hmm. Fossil eggs alone tell you a lot about how a dinosaur or other extinct animal begins its life. You know, even though you're not looking at the physical development, you may be looking at was there caretaking? Where were they born? Was it in a nest? Yeah, a lot of those a, things. There was a fascinating study not too long ago. I don't remember if we talked about this on the podcast. I don't think so. That also involved Greg Erickson, where they were able to estimate how long it took for certain dinosaurs to hatch by looking at the development signatures in their the embryo teeth. Yes, yes, indeed. 
Sim similar things have been found by looking at the shell com composition and in how minerals and, and chemicals are being exchanged there to start learn things about the development of the egg and the the processes there. The main aspects though that come up when you talk about ontogeny in the fossil record are the difficulties. Yes. For a number of reasons, the two most obvious being babies are delicate and baby fossils are not super common. So it's they're very a small, small sample size. Yeah. They're, they're small, they're delicate, they don't fossilize very well. If they, if they got killed because of hunting, may have just been consumed. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's like you don't get, I, they're not being left out in the world they're not to resilient. be discovered all that much. So there's not quite the body of evidence to answer some of the questions we have. And we'll focus on dinosaurs because those are a lot of the fun ones. Uh, so that's going to be the focus of, of these fossils, but there's always room for more examples. If you want to hear more, let us know. There are a few cases where we do have really phenomenal ontogenetic series. An ontogenetic series is when you have much of, if not all of, if you're really lucky, the developmental sequence from newborn to adult. Once again, going back to our, our home base, the gray fossil site has excellent evidence when it comes to the tapers. We have bitty bitty baby tapers all the way up to geriatric cavity toothed tapers. Yes. And basically every single moment in between there, <laughs> we probably have enough specimens to almost make up every year. It's It's ridiculous how many there are there, but it shows you from almost birth to definitely death because they're there so <laughs> there's only one way for them to become a fossil part of the display in the ornithischian room of the american museum of natural history is a sequence of protoceratops skulls and i have a picture of this so i'll put it in the blog post but it oh, goes cool. from super tiny little protoceratops skull up to the adult in fact my posting that picture on our common descent twitter account was what commented robert bosnecker to make a snarky, joking snarky, he's a cool guy, comment about the interpretation of that, which led to our Twitter account making a comment about ontogeny, which led to Nick suggesting this topic as an episode. It's all connected. There's another, I, I can't remember where this is. I have a picture of it somewhere and I'll find it in time for the blog post. It was, I, I think it might have been at the Smithsonian where they had a display of trilobite ontogeny. Yes, trilobites have great great records for it because crustaceans and other arthropods and all of those hard skinned animals that have to shed to molt their outer shell every single time they molt that new that empty shell has a potential to fossilize it's a little more delicate but it can still fossilize if it gets the right chance so there's actually really great arthropod ontogenies throughout the fossil record crabs developing in adulthood and, arth and, and trilobites and other hard-skinned, buggy, creepy, crawly things. And it's so cool to look at. It's really interesting. We do have recent ones, the, the ever-famous baby woolly rhino and mammoth. That is going, that it gives us examples of ontogeny to show what they look like young. We may not have a progressional series, but we do have baby. And with things like the mammoth, we even have pieces of preserved adults. So we can actually see on the outside, the, the uh, features of what they look like from young to old. So we do have cool fossil examples. The real kicker, especially when you're looking at the bones and what what you know gives rise to the potential of snarky comics about uh, developments, <laughs> is that it's sometimes very hard to tell what an adult is. This sounds like a odd statement because an adult's an adult. Is it a big one? Is it an adult? But there's a lot that goes into, define. first off, defining an adult. We touched on it at the beginning. What the definition for an adult is may not be the same for every organism. Yes. And, and if it's sexual maturity, well, we. how do you know that if it's just bones? How can you tell? Also, what if they continue to change shape after that? For instance, like silverback gorillas continue to become more mature even after they may be able to reproduce yeah they, they become more dominant as they get older and develop their their external features like that silver back and what if you're one of those pesky species that evolves to retain juvenile characteristics into adulthood 
<laughs> Indeed. You can get really complex with organisms you know, like cuttlefish that have multiple adult forms where there are big males and small males that look because <laughs> yeah. the males look like females because they're sneaky males. Yeah, elephant so you, seals do that too, right? Yeah, I believe. There's, yeah. there's elephant seals that are way more robust than the males and they try to sneak in acting like a female to do it with the females <laughs> while the big male is being all scary. Yeah. So what an adult is is very tricky. There's a number of of techniques to use to try to determine it. Typically, what people are are thinking of when they think of an adult, and the term that often gets used, even if it's not, if it's even if it's just implied but not full, just outright said, is that the adult form is the quote unquote ideal form, the fully developed, basically done, changing in big ways, and that's the form we try to use to define the species. You know, if I asked you to show me what an alligator looks like, you're not going to show me a baby alligator. You're going to show me a full grown alligator. Yes. If I ask you to show me an elephant, you're not going to show it before it's developed tusks. You're going to show it when it's all tusky and huge. Because to us, that's an elephant. The baby's not done cooking yet. It's still developing. <laughs> yeah, it's not achieved its ultimate ecological role yet and its ultimate sort of adult form. As you said earlier, it's final form. It's final form. So defining the stages, the life stages, is already difficult. When do you actually transfer into an adult? Now, there are techniques that are used to try to mostly determine age, but some of these are used to try to determine maturity. The The first one that's the most obvious but has the most issues is body size. Grown-ups are big. Kids are small. And it does get used from time to time, but the issue we run into is what if there's a, a neotenous or a pygmy species, a species that looks almost identical but stays tiny all the time. Yes, or what if you have a species that just gets really big before it's done maturing? Exactly. What if you find a huge one and it's still not actually a grown-up? Also, what if you just find a really big one or a really small one? Like, what if I just didn't get enough nourishment so I stayed small? Or what if I'm one of those freaky record breakers? You know, those <laughs> the 20-foot crocodiles that you find out in Australia that they... When you see that saltwater crocodiles can get to 20 feet long, which I, I say when I talk about it, they do not get to some have. It has happened. What if you found one of those as an adult and all of a sudden you get, oh, well, these other 13 foot ones must not be done yet. Well, no, that one was just a freak. <laughs> that was a monster. Yeah. It's so, like that kid I went to a school with who was six foot tall at the age of 11. Yes. I, ha I had a similar <laughs> a, a guy in middle school that was just towering over it. And so size is very difficult to use as a determiner. It can help support, but it's not going to be your answering. A fun one is bone fusion. Yes, that's the one I always think of. I love this one. So bone fusion, as we mentioned, changes as you age. Babies have very, they have squishy skulls because their bones aren't done meeting up yet. They have very flexible bones because the parts of their bone have not fused together. They're also growing much more, so you, you you know you have a lot of those. They need those gaps to be able to let it grow until they fuse into one big piece because now this is as big as you're getting. A great example, surprise, surprise, this is my episode, so I can talk about as much as I want. Alligators! <laughs> Crocodilians actually have a really cool process of fusion that gives a really great example on how we can use this to try to determine rough age or phase of life of a fossil crocodile. They start fusing from the back of the body and move forward. So the How vertebrae, convenient. it's really, really cool. <laughs> the vertebrae on an alligator are actually in two pieces when they're young. They just pop apart. So the part where the actual nerve cord, the, the, our, our neural cord goes actually is in between those two pieces. But yeah, an older the, alligator. The lamina up top and then the. Yes. This, I, I'm pretty sure that a lot of animals. Do that, That's very I, common. I think we do that too. Yes, I believe that so. That our laminae fuse. If you ever heard of a laminectomy? Yes. Uh, yes my grandmother yes. got one of those where they, they have to move or remove the top part of the vertebra. And so those are separate. And then as they get older, they fuse into one big solid piece. But they typically start toward the back and move forward. And so basically, if you find a fossil alligator whose skull is started to fuse, it's a pretty pretty decently mature alligator if their skull is fully fused you know especially in the back portion Ooh, he's that, a big one. 
that's an old alligator. Their skull and their skull will look different. You won't be able to see the lines between the bones the same way you used to be able to, even if they're holding together tight. And this happens all across. You see it in people. You mm-hmm. see turtle shells do this. Yeah. And a, a bunch of people look at the the skull fusion. If the top of your head is fused, you're definitely an older individual of that species. There's still some 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 debate on some of these these examples because not all animals fuse the same way and not all evidence for the fusions are definite or or you know for sure so there might be some debate on exactly what's happening surface texture a lot of animals get more roughly textured surfaces of their bones as muscle increases and needs more places to pull on a lot of animals with features like horns uh, or or facial displays will have more what we call rugos yeah uh, features that pebbly or or bumpy grooved, bumpy texture once again crocodilians are a great example of this they're smooth and then they're they are like pimply <laughs> they they just have all these yes. marks <laughs> when they're old and lots of animals show this it's it's that that think of it as knobby it'll it just gains more texture over time and growth but also for that increased connective tissue reproductive maturity can be identified in certain cases of course the presence of eggs if you got eggs inside, or if you have an embryo inside, ho- hopefully that's yours. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how you got a hold of it otherwise. <laughs> Potentially brooding on a nest could be, but yeah, there's also the care. case that maybe that's a relative, or maybe that's a juvenile that's helping, you know, if it's a social group that is helping take care of the young as well. So you can't, there's no way to do a, a you are the mother yes. test. So... <laughs> You can't be 100% sure. An interesting one is medullary bone. This is a a type of bone. It's a, a part of the bone found in, in many birds and egg-laying animals that basically acts as a source of calcium while forming the eggshell. Yeah, it only develops in gravid females. Mm-hmm. So when they're getting ready to lay eggs, they develop this extra bone. It'll be on normal bones, but they they increase, they bulk up certain certain portions that then will decrease, that will become less dense as they lay the eggs and develop them. And so you can find this in conveniently dinosaurs laid eggs. So you can find it in them sometimes. I believe it's also been reported in pterosaurs. Oh, that's cool. One of the big ones that will lead into our next section, which is one of the really big debates of the the modern paleontology age is bone histology. So histology is the microscopic study of the development and organization of tissues. So this is zooming in on the inside of the bones. Yeah, you my 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 buddy Mike Demick does this. Oh, that's cool. A lot of studies and he'll get dinosaur bone, leg bones are really good for this. Cut a thin section down the middle and then put it under the microscope. Which is the the first difficulty because not everyone wants you to cut their fossil. Yes. <laughs> so this is, you know, you'll come across resistances here and there where it's like, hey, I know you have this one of a kind fossil in your museum collection. Could I please chop it up? <laughs> yeah, some that people is not always a good, no, but basically by looking at this, you can see different bone types and bone growths going on. Yeah, you get these lines, lines of arrested growth that are basically like tree rings. Exactly. Especially in animals like reptiles that are extremely affected by the cold and warm seasons. They leave very well-read lags, as you'll, you'll see LAGs is sometimes how it'll be put in for lines of arrested growth. Yeah, if you got a good enough record in a bone, you can actually count the years. You can get a, at least a minimum age. This is seven years old or something, mm-hmm. yeah. This has been used for some very interesting findings. Typically, the names you'll see pop up for it are uh, Jack Horner and a couple of other people who have looked into it. Uh, Mark Goodwin is one of them, and John Scanella as well. Will pop. They have. They. You'll see those names pop up a lot if you were to look this up yourself when it comes to fossils. Basically, what what they have looked at is that by looking at this growth, not only can you see the the lines of arrested growth, the the tree rings. But you can also see different texture of bone because when you're developing, your bone transitions from primary, that fast-growing young bone, 
that's that's shooting you up, making you big as fast as you can because you're needing to get big, to secondary bone that's kind of set, that, that's, that still can grow, still can heal, but is not getting bigger very fast. The way they describe it is spongier, fast-growing bone and the more solid, set, older bone, which is something you absolutely can see. They have used it to make some, to some people, very upsetting <laughs> suggestions, but very interesting, very interesting uh, suggestions that deal with the fact that sometimes, not only is it hard to tell whether it's an adult or not, sometimes it's hard to tell whether these are developmental stages of one organism or multiple species. Yes, if you saw the skeleton of an adult alligator and the skeleton of a baby alligator, would you think that it was a baby and adult of the same species? Or would you think, wow, these are so different that they must be something else? Especially when you think about things like, like an elephant. If you saw a baby elephant skull and an adult elephant skull, you'd be like, wow, this weird elephant doesn't even have tusks and it was super small. Yeah, well, yeah, a baby <laughs> elephant is big enough to be a full-grown animal easily that's a that's a big cow like bison like <laughs> animal so it's not not surprising at all to think that maybe that was its own weird cousin yeah so this this comes up a lot and this has been something that has the the issue of this confusion has been known but some of these suggestions for potential changes in development versus species have been very recent and as we said at the beginning, are actually sometimes fairly heated debates. These are these are very recent, still very discussed. So all yeah. of these things are still being determined. You'll see it going both ways. Some have support from multiple sides. Some have contention from multiple sources. So yes. one of the great examples that kind of sparked a lot of these thoughts was uh, Peter Dodson, scientists who in 1975 decided to look at the growth of certain birds focusing on the cassowary. My favorite bird. <laughs> the cassowary is a very cool bird from Australia. They're flightless. So two powerful legs, very much like an ostrich, a long neck, very much like an ostrich. Very similar to the other bird there, the emu. Except they have two giant claws, one on each foot. The middle toe has turned into this large bayonet-like structure. It's just this large nail that can and has killed people because they jump up like we often like to draw dromaeosaurs, the velociraptors and Deinonychus, yeah. jumping up at their prey. And they also have this, what people call a helmet on their head, this crest, this hard, keratinized crest on the top of their head that they use to push their way through the undergrowth where they, they live. They use it to push their way through the branches and stuff. And it's also a sign of, of, of virility and all that good stuff. It's a display. Yeah. He found that, like most birds, they are very, very fast growing up front and then slow down once they're uh, uh, bigger. Many dinosaurs also show fast growth during their development where they, from small, get big very fast. Yeah, the cases where we have a lot of individuals in a growth series, you can get actual growth curves. There are as famous studies on things like T-Rex, where it has an S-curve that it's slow growth at the beginning, growth spurt at pretty much the same ages as humans, funnily enough, and then they level off again. But there was another study that Mike was part of, Dr. Demick, who, where, where they were looking at a sauropod called Rapidosaurus, and they found possible evidence that they grew like birds do oh, super fast right out of the gate to get to those huge, huge sizes. So yeah, different dinosaurs had different growth patterns as well. I was very tempted to ask if you would say that name again. <sighs> <laughs> but cassowary crests. <laughs> they found, or uh, Dodson found, that when the cassowary was about 80% of their adult size, the crest had not started to form. <laughs> so at almost full grown, they didn't really look like a cassowary yet. And this started to, this, this basically brought up the idea that you could have two dinosaurs almost the same size that look almost nothing alike because they're missing some key feature, like a big head crest or other, or other 
defining features of the skull or body, and they just may not have developed it yet. They may be a younger version that's just at the cusp of showing off that they're an adult. And it's it the way to think about it also is like with puppies. It used to baffle me when I was younger, and they'd be like, oh, this is my puppy. And I was like, no, that's a big dog. It's like, <laughs> oh, it's just, but it's only like two yeah. years old. But that's as big as that old dog. Yeah, because they reach full size before they're ever mature, mature. Another thing that has come up in, in studies like that is that a lot of creatures, the bones can not only, things will develop later, but features will change that certain features will change their shape or certain bone will be resorbed as the yes. creature grows older. So you can get these remodeling of features as animals grow up. Yeah, a feature you had when you were young goes away to be replaced by a feature as an adult. This is what sparks a a trend that, like I said, you will see Jack Horner's name with m many of these, but there are other people who have suggested similar things. Basically, the suggestion is that by looking at different species of dinosaurs that are close related and with very similar features, mainly looking at the histology, looking at the inside of those bones and looking at which ones are growing and which ones are not growing much, they have suggested that there are many species that really are just growth phases. Yeah, they're arguing that we have, we have accidentally called different growth stages different species. We have, we have over-identified. We have yeah over we have uh, named more species than there actually are, which is not crazy. But there's there's definitely contention on some of them. I have three big examples. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is that made the news, you know, very very aggressively when it first came up, <laughs> and also incorrectly. But it was an interesting time. Was a dinosaur named Tortosaurus and Triceratops. Yeah. You may recognize the second one, and many fossil friends will recognize the first one. These are both ceratopsians, or the, the horn and frilled dinosaurs. Your classic four-legged, big, flat frill behind the back of the head, and often three horns, but some of them had less, and some of them had even some on the frills. And so you had a whole bunch of different horns going on among the group, and different shaped frills. These two look like your classic three-horned dinosaur, Triceratops being the classic and popular one, and Torosaurus being a slightly larger version of that. But overall, very similar in shape. The main thing that set them apart in many ways was their size, and Torosaurus has two large openings in its frill. They ran into a major question, though, on Torosaurus especially, because as of yet, a juvenile Torosaurus had not been found. And so there's the question of why, where, where are the babies? Why are there no babies of this animal? And this, this pops up with other animals that this, the, this suggestion has been made for. And already they had looked at the growth series of Triceratops and found that their, their frill actually changes very aggressively. It starts with these little like triangle spikes and then those get resorbed into a much smoother edge. So there's a lot of change there. Their horn shape changes as goes they grow? Triceratops? Pointing up to pointing forward. Yep. Which is, so you get a lot of things like that. The suggestion was made that Taurosaurus could just be a bigger Triceratops whose frill has now expanded and developed these holes. Yeah, that if you line up the ontogenetic series of Triceratops, they suggested Taurosaurus fits on the end of that. And when they looked at the histology, they found that Triceratops still seemed to be growing and Taurosaurus seemed to be pretty much finished. And so this now this is where the real tension comes, because if they were to what we call synonymize, if we were to add these species together into a single group, the older the, the older species name gets kept and the younger species name is eliminated, which mm -hmm. means Taurosaurus would no longer be a dinosaur in its own right. Yes, it is now adult Triceratops. Yeah, so basically you have one species, well, one genus where you thought you had two, and you lose one, the name at least. That's And that's the dramatic part, is to many it feels that you are <laughs> eliminating this, what, you know, for many people, favored, you know, very favorite and, and popular species. <laughs> many of the news things that came out at the time were like, they're getting rid of Triceratops, which... No, they is, weren't. They flipped it. No, they were getting rid of Taurosaurus. Potentially. 
adding to Triceratops. There has been a lot of resistance to this. Some research has not agreed with it. So there is research against it, but the initial research uh, researchers stand their ground and saying that they still feel that the evidence is substantial. So that, that one's still going. There are other horned dinosaurs This is ha- that similar things like this are happening with. The Nettoceratops is getting similar treatment, so that's still in the works. Probably one of the most flashy versions, because it deals with three dinosaurs, is the Stiggy Moloch, a cousin of the Pachycephalosaurus, the very famous dome head dinosaur, walked on two legs and for many is portrayed as hitting its head against stuff and each other. These are the famous dome headed dinosaurs, the Pachycephalosaurus. And you have Pachycephalosaurus, who is fairly big, large domed head, Stiggy Moloch, who is definitely a cousin, but slightly smaller, not much of a dome, and they also have these little spikes around the back of their head. Yeah, they're flatter headed. Uh, yeah, much more flat, you know, still got a little bump, but not not anything compared to Pachycephalosaurus. And then there's another dinosaur found in the same area called Draco Rex, Hogwartsii, the Dragon King of Hogwarts. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Named af- name not too long ago after the books came out, obviously. <laughs> so yes. this is a fairly <laughs> recent dinosaur as all things go. Once again, looking at the histology of these bones and lining the skulls up, they noticed that if you look at the skulls in line from smallest individual, Draco Rex, to Stiggy Moloch, to Pachycephalosaurus, you would see that the horns slowly recede and the bump slowly forms. And looking at the histology shows that the first two are very actively growing, and Pachycephalosaurus, for the most part, are done growing, which would mean that all three of these species are actually Pachycephalosaurus, just in their awkward baby and teen years. This is another one that has been met with some resistance, different studies pointing different directions, because that's a big dramatic one, if that's right. And, And it's possible that part of that could be true, that maybe two of them are the same species and one of them isn't, um, it's possible that none of it's true. It's possible that they're all the same. But it, it, this this revelation that the skeletons and skulls change so much, you know, this is one of those things that has come about and forced paleontologists to look again. Exactly. You know, it's what it's like. All right, we might be right about all this stuff, but here's a here's something to think about to to top off the controversial heap. Oh of- boy. Dealing with dinosaurs. There's no way to not be controversial when you mention Tyrannosaurus. Not even a little bit. Just everything about this darn dinosaur. It's one of those things where, like, if you're in a crowded room and you go, well, actually, T-Rex, everyone goes, hmm? <laughs> yes. <laughs> lean in and give you this, you better say the right thing. You better, you better talk about T-Rex for my favorite movie. So T-Rex has... Named in 1988 a pygmy cousin known as Nanotyrannus. Potentially. Potentially. This is basically a very small, more slender, sleek version of T-Rex. Has an interesting history. It was actually originally placed in the Gorgosaurs, with Gorgosaurus, and then with Albertosaurus, two more Tyrannosaurs, but kind of bounced. And then was eventually named its own group Nanotyrannus. But then, not too long after... A study on Albertosaurus over a very complete ontogenetic series of them by Thomas Carr showed that there's actually some very notable changes from from the juveniles to the adults. The juveniles tend to be much more thin-toothed and have a more gracile or thin and and like you know runner-like body, while the adults are more heavy set and have more large, robust teeth. Which in itself is really interesting because it suggests that tyrannosaurs may have, like alligators, changed their ecological role as they grew up. Indeed. And so there's cool things to be drawn from that. The juveniles being lighter and potentially faster means they may be eating smaller, quicker prey. Not only does this give them different prey items until they're big, it also avoids competition, which is one of the cool things about crocs and other animals like that that are not We're not 100% sure on theropods, but alligators are not social throughout. But if they're not social and they're kind of on their own, then you don't want to be competing with dad or mom because they're the size of a couple of elephants. And 
I'll go after the little animal scurrying around on the floor. Once you're big, now you can switch away from small, fast-moving prey to bigger, heavier ones, and you can better defend your prey. So you may be able to go after carcasses or take down something big that'll take you forever to eat, but you're big enough to chase everyone else away. So it, it kind of balances the ecosystem among the predators themselves. Yes. So that's a very cool feature. It was realized very quickly that Nano Tyrannus matched the features being described for a young theropod. Yes. So it was posited, and it had actually already been suggested, even when it was bouncing around the other groups, that Nano Tyrannus is actually just a juvenile T-Rex. So now they need to look at it. Now, there's definitely differences. Uh, Nano Tyrannus, different shape, but then so again, are, so are juveniles. They also have more teeth than adult T-Rexes typically do. But once again, looking at the histology, looked like Nano Tyrannus was still growing and T-Rex was not growing as much. They, they, they found some that even looked like some big T-Rexes might still be doing some growing. So maybe stuff there, but they saw that difference. Less growing in the big ones, lots of growing in ni- Nano Tyrannus. Yeah, they so also... Ha- oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, we, are, we have a series of T-Rex from young, younger to older. Not a, not a ton of them, but uh, there are a number of fossils that show us the growth series of Tyrannosaurus rex. And the suggestion here is that Nano Tyrannus, because it's si- same age, same area, fits into that growth series. That it's just one of the developmental stages. One of the really cool pieces of evidence for this is in the teeth. Because when they looked at big to smaller T-Rex and fit Nino Tyrannus within that, at the, the end of that series, they actually found that as you go through, they do slowly lose teeth. Interesting. There's actually a dinosaur named Limusaurus that just recently was reported on that completely loses its teeth Yeah. as it becomes an adult. This is not uncommon. Baby platypus are born with teeth, and then yep. they go to Bill. And so you find stuff like that. Once again, we lose teeth. We gain teeth when we get older, but there are animals that progressively work through the teeth they have. Elephants have the marching molars that slowly yes. grow from the back and then eventually run out of plugs and no more teeth. Now, this is very heavily debated. Oh, yes. So that wraps up for now. I did mention briefly that my research was in ontogeny, so I just wanted to plug it in there. I already actually covered this in episode two, our Crocs episode. So if you'd like to get a more detailed look, take a check out there. But basically I looked at the the growth of alligator skulls and how the different bones change over time to try to figure out what was actually causing their shape change. So you can even do zero to end things on individual bones of an animal, which is, there's almost no level you can't zoom this down to. This is one of those interesting kind of episodes that it very much is an introduction to a, a very broad subject of discussion. So it feels like each... I'm looking at our bullet list of things to talk about in this episode. Every section of this episode could easily be expanded into another conversation. And and will happily be done so if requested. <laughs> it, yeah, so if we hit on something in this episode that you, dear listener, think sounds really cool and you'd like to hear us expand it out to a full topic discussion... Let us know. Happily, happily. Well, thank you all. As usual, if you have any suggestions or if you'd like to hear more from anything we mentioned, contact us on all those social medias. Thanks again to our topic requester, Nick. Thanks, Nick. It's It was a lot of fun. We'll put a lot of cool pictures up and lots and lots of links. There's lots of cool links for this stuff on the blog post. If you have anything you'd like to talk to us about we are all ears otherwise we release episodes every fortnight two weeks we will see you next time for our next episode this episode has has reached the end of its development it is indeed the the ontogeny of ontogeny or it's been a good run or is this already episode 34 don't you get rid of my episode 33 <laughs> 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 synonymize <laughs> how to synonymize episode 33 and 34 yes. and welcome to juvenile episode 44 uh. <laughs> <laughs> stay tuned in two weeks to see what the next episode number is <laughs> goodbye for now see you everyone
Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.